Joining us on this episode is Eric Whitman. Eric is the CEO of Visco, one of the largest and most popular photo editing tools in the world. Previously the COO at Figma and head of platform services at Adobe, he has deep ties throughout his career to the photography industry and continues to be at the forefront of emerging technologies helping craft new ways to tell stories. I'm Kyla Wilson, and this is The Photographer's Problem. Hello and welcome. Today's podcast is hosted by me, James Broadbent, the founder and CEO of Narrative. And today I'm speaking with Eric Whitman, the CEO of Visco. Eric, thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, stoked to be here. Thanks, James, for the invite. Nice. Eric, um, I want to get straight into this. Um, okay, so today you are the CEO of Visco. Uh, you've worked at Figma. You spent um, 15 years, maybe more, at Adobe. At Adobe. You've sort of devoted a, the larger portion of your life working in this creative industry. And I think it'd be really interesting to hear, you know, why? What is it about uh, this industry that's important to you personally? Yeah. Look, I think for a lot of people who get into any sort of creative industry, it comes back to their roots. And if I think about my family and growing up, I was surrounded by creative people, you know, musicians, artists, people doing theater. I did theater for a stint. It's hard to find that on the internet. That's a good thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was always really just fascinated by their creativity, the creative process. And I think early on, my dad bought a, a old analog, you know, film camera when he was stationed in Asia. And I took a look at that thing and I got to play with it a little bit. And I said, you know what? This is an amazing instrument. Like it's a, it's a storytelling instrument. And it's something that I really wanted to figure out how to use and do. And so I think when I started to get into a career in tech, I was, you know, grew up here in San Francisco and, you know, surrounded by Silicon Valley and lots of technology companies. I just kind of accidentally got into a, a company, a startup. Uh, the startup was called Macromedia that was building creative tools to allow creative people to build their own creative things, right? CD-ROMs at the time and multimedia. But for me, it was incredibly exciting because I felt like this combination of my background with, you know, creative folks and this notion of like, hey, I can help other creative people make things by making tools for them. That felt to me, it was like, that was my purpose. That was my inspiration. And so for the last over 30 years, that's mostly what I've been doing is making things to help other people make things in a creative way. Yeah, that's very, that's, that's really cool. It's sort of, you know, as they talk about it, like uh, maybe it's like this intersection of um, a, a technology and a problem and you saw the problems that, you know, creatives were experiencing. You're like, there's so much we can do about this <laughs> and there's, there's so much more that we can do about it. And this is sort of what we're going to be talking about today, which is really focused on, you know, the, the, the future of the photography industry and um, yeah. really excited to, to chat to you about that. I mean, and before we get into that, I think um, maybe there's, uh, there's a few things that photographers have been thinking about recently. You know, it's like, what happened to Visco? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, the context of that is like, uh, when I started my photography career, uh, I, everyone I knew had used a Visco preset. And even still today, the preset that I use in my photography, if you like really like looked at that HSL sliders and maybe a bit of the tone curve, there's definitely a little bit of like Visco presets still hanging around in there. So, you know, um, you, Visco sort of made the, the shift to, to, to the mobile user and the consumer. You're now like one of the largest mobile editing apps of 200 million active users. And um, I, we're starting to see a little bit of a shift here. We, I know that you guys launched some tools for professional photographers last year. So what's the inside scoop? I'd, I'd love to hear that story of kind of what happened <laughs> And, and what's happening now. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and, I mean, it's funny. I run into photographers all over the world who say the same thing. Like Visco was such a formative part of my early career. And some people will say, wink, wink, I'm still using your presets. Don't ask <laughs> me how I got them, right? Like, <laughs> you know, totally cool. It's fair game. 
Yeah, it's it's I you know I mean look, Visco's history is amazing. So you know Joel and Greg, who were the co-founders of Visco, you know they're they're creatives, they're photographers themselves, and they created a company to really help other creators try to make it as as they had had done. It was a little bit of a give back, and that you know that first success point for them was the presets, was the Lightroom presets, and. You know, to this day, I think, again, it's still something that people really love and cherish and they know Visco for. And, you know, mobile was was an amazing, you know, um, inflection point for the company because, you know, here you have these very powerful cameras now on these devices. But editing was still really difficult. Like, oh, am I going to move this over to my desktop computer to do some edits so I can put it back on my mobile device to share it again? Like that workflow is super janky. So the fact that you had an app that was, you know, very powerful, you could do capture, you could do you know, really powerful editing, but in a very simple, approachable way, I think was really what Rose um, uh, brought, brought a lot of people onto Visco, you know, for, for, in some cases, for the first time. And then over time, Visco started to add community because they realized, hey, people, you know, Creatives like to spend time with other creatives and let's try to create a community in this app. And, you know, if you, if you know, we're both creative, but, you know, spending time with other creatives, like the creative process is one in which, you know, causes you to be very vulnerable, right? I'm putting a bit of myself out there and traditional social media yeah, you know, when people are putting their stuff out there, especially today, like it's just, you know, you're at the mercy of the internet at that point. And that doesn't really feel good as a creative. And so Visco early on tried to create a little bit of a safer space, more of a community vibe and feel to it. And so that was really great and healthy. However, you know, I think there's a lot of people who were also looking for that sort of safe community to interact with that were really more consumers. Um, and so what you'll see is over time, like as you get into the tw 2017, 2018 period for Visco, um, this was kind of when you saw the rise of the Visco girl come up where a lot of younger women, you know, left traditional social media, went to Visco because of it, it was this, you know, safer place for them to interact and to express themselves. And, and at the time, you know, I think, people made a decision at Visco, which was, hey, should we still continue to focus on more aspiring professional and professional photographers, or should we go after more of a, of a consumer play? And the decision was to go after more of a, a casual creator or consumer play. And I think that worked for a bit. However, it really kind of alienated the previous base that got Visco to where it was at. And for a couple of years, you know, we lost a lot of those great, you know, OG photographers, if you will, and tried to compete in a very competitive consumer world, which is extremely difficult, you know, because now you're competing with you know, the Facebooks, Metas of the world, you know, and other traditional social media players. And um, it didn't really play out well um, for, for, for the company from a long-term standpoint. So when I came in a couple of years ago, I kind of looked at our rich history and looked at just what I saw as an amazing opportunity to, you know, really work with our photography community again and really try to understand what is it that's bothering them? What are the pain points like that they have on a day in, day out basis? And let's go back to really nurturing and supporting that market, that community and start to build for them again. And it was, it was about in 2022 is when we kind of relaunched our company. You know, we said, hey, Visco is really, we're about serious you know, creators. Again, people who really are aspiring creative pros. And we are going to nurture and support you and start to come out with new products, new tools, and new ways to help people make a living from that creativity again. So that's firmly where we're at again. Uh, we're not getting distracted <laughs> you know, by any sort of you know, consumer plays. Uh, and, uh, and we think right now it's actually been working. We're, we're, we're getting a lot of positive feedback. We're seeing a lot of people who were Visco users several years ago, but sort of walked away from us. Now they're coming back and they're spending a lot more time on, on Visco creating, 
you know, nurturing great community and discovering other people's work and getting inspired by that, which is causing them to like, want to go do more work uh, themselves. So it's a, it's a very, it's a very happy kind of rebirth moment for, for Visco and uh, the team's been pumped and doing great work. Yeah. It's awesome. And I'm, I'm personally very excited about it as well. There's some, some, some cool things that you're working on. The, the story of sort of, um, you know, the shift from the professional to the consumer in some ways, it's almost like the, it's, it's a common like startup story where you go out and you raise venture capital and they're like, you know, take up millions of dollars uh, and you've got to tell the story of like, we're going to take over the world. The TAM, the total addressable market is huge. It's every single person that has a mobile phone. And so all of a sudden you kind of get a bit distracted from, you know, maybe this great opportunity that that's right there in, in front of you. Um, yeah. that's, so, it's so right. I mean, people see big markets and they think if we could only get a certain percentage of that big market, shouldn't we go after that too? So it, it's easy to get distracted, but I think I've learned over many, many years, you know, it's really important to understand who your, the, that core customer is, right? The core person that you're really trying to support and serve. And, you know, until you're done serving them, until they're saying, hey, there's nothing else I could ever want to get from a company like you, you just got to keep supporting them and, and, and going after them because new opportunities will always come up from that. But you got to stay focused on that, on that person. Yeah. And so, I mean, uh, yeah, I love your story. Like you, as you said, you started working for Macromedia. Macromedia was, uh, it was, you know, back in, in 92, you, Macromedia was acquired in 2005 by Adobe. You hung around there for quite a long time. Uh, and you've seen a lot, you've seen a lot of change. You've seen technology go through like a, a whole bunch of iterations, especially sort of in this industry. What do you think have been some of the most significant changes that you've seen? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, I've probably seen so many different types of, of technology platform shifts over the years from, you know, literally I'm, I'm dating myself, but, you know, the CD-ROM floppy disk era to sharing hard drives to really basic networking and cloud computing to mobile to now where we're at today with very sophisticated cloud computing and AI. And I think, you know, there's really two areas I think that still, that, that have changed a lot. Um, I think the first uh, is both a story of simplification, but now more complexity. And that is around just workflows in general. I think, you know, it was really hard to just even simply share files or process files um, kind of in the, in the earlier days of, of computing. And, you know, now obviously the, the tools and the compute power that we have are disposable, it, like it makes it so much easier to process and also share files with, 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 with others. Um, however, I think things are getting complicated again, because now, you know, if you look at the average like photo shoot and how many photos people are shooting, I mean, it's, it's 10 plus thousand so now I have to, there's so much more I now need to process. Uh, so where in the past, maybe people are only shooting a thousand you know, shots or maybe even you know, analog film, maybe a couple hundred. Now it's tens of thousands. And I think it, understanding like, do you understand my style? Do you understand how I'm trying to cull and optimize that project that I have? Like that is still something that I think a lot of people uh, uh, continue, especially photographers, continue to struggle with. I think that's the same case with video. You know, I think there's a lot of video that's being shot and how do I just quickly and succinctly edit this so that my client gets a really great finished product. Um, I think video is even infinitely more complicated, especially given how easy it is to shoot video. Um, I, I think another area too, that's still being, um, that, that has been made, that has been simplified, but has also become more complex is just working with others on a project. You know, I think a lot of the, you know, collaboration software that was built was really designed for kind of teams within companies. But, you know, in the creative world, you're you're building teams in an ad hoc way, right? Rarely are the same people, same team working on the same sets of projects. And so how how can you make ad hoc collaboration, you know, not only amongst a creative team, but also a creative team with their clients? What are the ways that you can actually make and improve and make that easier? So 
a lot of things have gotten better. And in some cases, there's still a lot of opportunity to innovate uh, to solve some of the new new problems that have been created. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with, you know, some of the new technologies that we're seeing. I think, um, you know, with the workflow problem, the problem was that they just kept making shutter speeds faster and faster. And, and like, you know, now you can shoot 60 frames a second of photos. And uh, and so n- no one wants to miss the moment. And it's it's actually really funny with, with narrative. Lots of our users say to us, you know, like, I can select my images way faster with narrative, but now I go out and I shoot way more photos because I know I can call them faster. And the net result is that I have better images because I never miss a moment. But it's like, yeah, you're, yes. um, you're in a position. Well, that's it, right? Where... I mean, you've got that vision, right? You know, you're, you're in a moment and you have that vision as a creative and you don't want to miss the moment. And just like, I, I, I know just the other day, I was, I was using my, 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 my phone, but like there was a hot air balloon and it was, it was going through two trees and I'm like, I'm just going to frame this right. And I, you know, I'm trying to do this on my phone. I should have just went inside, grab my camera, but it was a split second thing. Right. And I missed the moment. So it, it was never perfectly in between the two trees. And I just wish I had faster shutter <laughs> speed on, on my phone. So I could have got that perfect moment. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about, I guess, some of, you know, some of the tools we've been using during that time. And um, I guess, you know, I've been using Lightroom since maybe 2008 or something like that. And, you know, a, as a product, you know, the concept of what it is and what it does, like some, you know, file management, some, you know, parameter adjustments, uh, the ability to export and like modify the images in a few different ways. You know, I'm I'm overgeneralizing, but it's pretty much the same as it was, you know, in 2008. Recently, we've seen a few new like cool tools around subject masking and some AI denoise and upscaling and stuff like that. But, you know, why do you think Lightroom has kind of been the same product, you know, since 2008, all while at the same time, you know, we we're talking about our cameras before. It's like nearly every aspect of my camera has changed and improved the focusing system, you know, the shutter speed, the resolution, the quality of my lenses. Like, yeah, w- what's happening? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, first off, you know, I give, uh, you know, this is my alma mater, as you said, but, you know, I, I give them uh, a lot of respect for building uh, a great product and one that, you know, still the de facto standard that people are using in the industry. Um, and I think, you know, because of that, sometimes when you become the de facto standard and are such for so long, you can, you can get stagnant, right? Um, especially when there's not a lot of, a lot of competition out there. Um, I would say that, you know, what's interesting, and I've seen this, you know, not only at my Adobe days, but even my time at Atlassian and, and at Figma is that a lot of companies try to do the innovation themselves. When in fact, the best innovation that happens with some of these products is coming from the outside. You know, it's from these bigger ecosystems that you can build. And, you know, I think Figma recently has done a phenomenal job, like hats off to Dylan and the team for really building a lovely extension model so that third parties can more closely integrate with Figma, the product. And you just see the innovation happen just leaps and bounds. And, you know, back to Visco's background like that, well, first, one of the first things we did was build, you know, presets for Lightroom. And, um, you know, Lightroom, you know, th- that extensibility layer, that plugin model wasn't really designed, you know, to sort of support an ecosystem around it. And so when you're a company that's putting a lot of time and energy and dollars into building, you know, presets or extensions for Lightroom, and you're not necessarily feeling like you're supported and that there isn't an opportunity to build an ecosystem or a business around that product, I think that's going to just artificially limit the innovation in the product. And it might be seen as like potentially competitive, but I actually think if you look at the best products and the best platforms that have been around for a long time and continue to innovate, they've built really strong extensibility models to their products and support a thriving ecosystem around it. So I think that's still a big opportunity for Adobe and for Lightroom in general. Uh, and, and there's a lot of work that would need to uh, happen in order to support that. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's interesting that you sort of, um, you know, like the Figma example is such a great example where, you know, they really sort of, um, yeah, as you say, Dylan and the team had this vision of how design should be done differently and sort of, um, you know, started to own this category that was owned by Adobe for such a, a long time. Do you see the same risk for Lightroom with, uh, you know, the, the without with the lack of innovation that's happening i guess yeah it's it's interesting because it's really hard for people to want to change tools right it takes it takes a, a fundamentally different approach and with a 10x improvement to really encourage people to, to to shift off and we definitely saw this with figma right i mean did we have all of the illustration and product design features that like an illustrator or a sketch had no and there was a lot of debate internally that, oh, we just need to add one more feature and one more feature. And I said, the killer feature that we have isn't that our, our Beziers are, are, are better or that our layering model is better or that we're missing some masking tool. It's the fact that our entire model is 10x better. And that is a model around really helping an entire team collaborate around a product design project. And it was so simple and so easy and yet so powerful. And that was that that was the model shift. And, and you saw very quickly, you know, more and more people were experimenting with Figma and then eventually switching the, their entire teams and workflows over to Figma because it was 10x better when it came to collaboration. And I think, again, back to Lightroom, I think there are a lot of areas that Lightroom still isn't fully addressing and and especially around workflows and simplification of workflows for people. And, you know, I think companies, there are many companies out there that are, you know, improving upon that narrative included. Um, and there are other aspects of the workflow, especially on the collaboration side that are, aren't being addressed yet. And I do feel that that's, that's a point of vulnerability for, you know, Lightroom in particular. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping they are paying attention to that and they do want to like innovate, but if not, as we've seen many, many times in, in the history of technology, there's a lot of disruption that, that, yeah. that, that, can, that can happen. So yeah, beware. And I guess, you know, um, no CEO stands up on a podcast and says like, this is what we're going to do. You can't sort of like disclose your roadmap, but like what part does Visco play in that sort of like biggest story that we're talking about here? Yeah, I, I still feel like, you know, in, in, in our heart, we, we, we love building creative tools, you know, for photographers. And so for us, to, I think our claim to fame has always been we take really compl complex things, especially from a creation standpoint, and make it very approachable and very easy to do. And so I think what we want to do is continue to come out with new creative or new workflows that just make it that much more simpler for a photographer to, to produce that vision, right? To be able to go tell that story faster. So that's part of our equation that we want to do. I think the other part of what we want to do is this notion of community and making it easier for our community to find each other and collaborate with each other on projects. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I mean, more and more photographers are, are solopreneurs. And it's, it's, a, it's, a lonely, it's a lonely place out there. And as, as platforms like Instagram have basically abandoned photographers, and, you know, we, we, we feel that there's, there's an opportunity to really create that new home for photographers and a place where you can meet, collaborate, and, and you know, really get inspired by, by other people. Um, and I'd say lastly, like, we care a lot about helping photographers make a living. And so finding more ways for photographers to get exposure for their work and then to be, to be able to match make them with potential companies or brands that are looking for people who have their skills and their style, that's another really big focus for us as well. And we feel that those three together, just, you know, Visco's in a unique position where we can deliver on all three of those and just really make a difference out there in the yeah. photography community. Yeah. That community piece is so important as well as like, you know, as you were saying, most people are kind of, they're not working in a, you know, maybe like a, a team or something like that. They're individual sole traders and you're all sort of self-taught. You, you learned from someone that you watched on, 
YouTube or in a Visco community group or something like that. And you're like yeah. trying to work it out. <laughs> what do I do yeah. in this situation? Yeah. I mean, like, as you think about the, the future of the photographer's workflow, like we've got all these tools that are, well, maybe new technologies that uh, we're starting to see. And, you know, like um, maybe narrative is a good example of this where, you know, AI is sort of like um, an opportunity. And I think a lot of photographers, um, uh, you know, a lot of photographers are uncertain about what that means. What does that mean for like, my the creative aspect of me as a photographer and you talked about um the vulnerability of being a photographer and the process of creating something and that creating something is something that like it comes from in here it's like i made this because it meant something to me and there's there's a big part of that creative process that you know could never be replicated by a machine like this is what makes creativity this is like just central to what creativity is is as a it's just like this human experience of um yeah like taking the things that influenced you as a person and 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 using that to create something and and like do you have a vision around how that partnerships happens as we see like because you know of course you, you guys in the background you'll be work, you'll be working on some on 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 ai products and tools everyone is right now how, how do you think that that happens how do you yeah, see that I developing think, i mean i think you know again ai is a tool you know it's like still creativity is going to be very human-centered right and ai is going to assist with the development of of that vision and so whether it's things like okay i've got an idea and i just want to try and express that idea and i need a tool almost as a as a as a sparring partner to right to try and try and think about how that idea might manifest itself i mean we still believe in community first right but sometimes people just want to test something out themselves right do some mock-ups themselves as an individual and then they want to unfurl that a little bit more and talk to some trusted folks within the community to really enrich that idea. And then it's the tools to go about creating that thing and actually bring it to bring it to life. You know, I think AI is much like the internet sort of is, is pervasive across all the things, right? I think AI is gonna be an element of a lot of different tools from ideation to your workflow to eventually some of the output. Although, you know, I think what we're seeing you know, as a lot of these generative AI models are all tainted by, you know, copyright information. And, you know, um, until you start to see, in fact, in some countries, they've already stated like, look, if this thing is made with AI, it's not copyrightable, which, you know, if you're an artist, your creative studio, if you're a brand, your copyright is everything. And so you don't want to run the risk of using these, you know, models that are out there that have been built on top of, you know, artists' hard work. So, um, but I think there's always going to be a little bit of, of an element there that helps improve that process. Because at the end of the day, it's how do I get that vision that's in here, that's inspired by a lot of different things? How do I get that out, you know, yeah. to my client, yeah. to my audience, you know, yeah. as, as quickly as and effectively as possible? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that is the most important part. It's so interesting because when we started to see like these generative models come about and, you know, people started talking about, you know, like the end of the commercial photographer and photo shoots are going to change forever. And like, um, it was kind of like sold as like AI is going to be the creative now. And I think, I think it's, it's, <laughs> I think it, it was presented in the wrong way. I think that the, the true power that we're going to see that sort of is going to come from AI is really in the, um, it's like doing the things that you don't want to do so that you can be <laughs> who you really want to be. And there's so many parts. Like it's it's not that it's like the smart 
creative, like forward thinking, like doing the amazing piece. It's like doing the dumb stuff. <laughs> it's yeah. doing the, like the painful parts where you just shouldn't have to do them. Um, Absolutely. And, and I think that that's kind of how we sort of think about it. I was going to say, that's what inspires me about the work that you all are doing, right? You, you hear this a lot, right? Most photographers, they just want to be out in the, out in the field, you know, shooting, right. Or working with clients, like different photographers in different genres are inspired by different things. But at the end of the day, the thing that they dread the most is like having to go back to their laptop in their studio, process all the images, do that pain, painful work. But if you can remove that pain and maybe like also apply AI to auto billing their clients and like getting paid by clients, you know, maybe I, AI can help on that side of things. But, but I think that like the workflow, the production part of things, absolutely. And, and that's why what you all are doing on the narrative side, like your team is building outstanding product that's actually solving real problems. Like this is a really good application of AI to solve the real problems that people have and not invent new, new ones that really aren't um, true problems today. So just, again, inspired by your work. Oh, thank you. I mean, and I, I think this is going to be, you know, a, a hot central topic for creatives for a long time that, you know, like, you, yeah, how, do, how, how do I, um, I, I mean, just so many questions, like, how, how do I continue to, to, to operate in this industry where there's so, so many things are changing so quickly? Like, how do I balance, you know, um, yeah, like the create my creative aspect of my time versus, you know, just optimizing my workflow and trying to automate as much of it as I can. And I think it's going to be really interesting. You know, we've, we've kind of, this conversation has been centered around, you know, where the, where the industry might go and where it's been and where it maybe hasn't changed a lot over the last time, uh, over the last period. And I think in the coming time, we're going to see a lot more change and uh and so photographers are are um maybe yeah it, it's there's maybe a little bit of uncertainty a little bit of instability a little bit of um you know like change that they'll need to navigate um and and maybe this is like kind of where visco's community comes in um you know like you've got this global community this space where um I, I don't know how how big it is millions of photographers connect on a on a daily weekly monthly basis like wh why yeah. do photographers why are they involved in in visco's community well i think it's it's interesting cuz first is what a lot of people you know there's all there's a broad range of photographers that are on visco or you have some folks who have been photographers for decades who are and successful professional photographers and you know they they enjoy visco for many reasons. Part of it is just to see what's going on, like the, the trends, they get inspired by other people's work. Uh, in some cases, we find situations where these accomplished photographers find Visco as a great community to give back. They see these aspiring photographers who are just trying to figure out a lot of things. Like maybe they're just trying to figure out what their personal style is. Maybe they're trying to figure out, how do I find my first client even? Um, uh, in some cases, folks are these, these, these experienced folks are saying, Hey, if, if you're looking for, for mentorship, why don't you come be a second shooter? I'm, 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 you know, if you're in LA this weekend, come down, I've, I've got a commercial shoot. Why don't you be a second shooter? Or just be a production assistant and just learn through osmosis. So it's really amazing to see like how engaged our community is and how really supportive and nurturing they are to each other. That gives me just a lot of faith in not only just photographers and the creative industry in general, but just humanity. When you see that much goodness that's happening by literally tens of millions of people, you know, on a monthly basis. And and, and I think for me, it's like that's, again, something we want to continue to, to, to nurture each other. Um, I think education, like there's a lot of misinformation that's out there, you know, about becoming a photographer or photography. And I think people use the community, the voice of the community to sort of dispel that because it's increasingly harder to just Google something and find like a true, authentic, honest answer 
there's just a lot of content and listicles and distractions there. But if I can go to a community that has been around for a while, is truly authentic and trusted, I'm going to get the real scoop from those folks. And that's going to help improve me, you know, as what I'm trying to do as a creative. So um, it, it is interesting, though. I, I still feel like, like you were saying earlier, James, like there was a moment where everyone do Visco. And now I would argue it's a moment where a lot of photographers kind of forgotten about Visco or think of Visco in this nostalgic way. But Visco is still very active, very much still around. And actually, our community is, is, is still growing. We just want more photographers to come on to Visco, feel like this is that home for them, and then we can just build something better together. Yeah. And, and on that note, I mean, um, you guys just released some new features last week sort of for for the the serious creator the do you want to talk about a little bit about what that is yeah i mean a couple things in, in the works i i think one um one thing that we have heard you know time and time again is that you know interacting with clients uh, can be difficult you know you have uh you know a photo shoot that you do some project that you do and and finding a way to more easily share that with clients and be able to get feedback from them. So we actually launched something last week called client spaces. And so spaces are something that we introduced actually a few years ago. And it was meant as almost like a visual um, gallery in which groups of people can just collaborate and spend time inspiring each other. And we see all types of amazing spaces. Like so some of them are super niche, which is just about like, amazing photos and conversations about doors. And some of them are, you know, really broad, you know, street photography or one's called under the hoop. And it's just about, you know, basketball. Uh, so it's just more ways of our community to engage with each other. But, but client spaces is really focused on a photographer who's done a project, just really easily being able to share that with, with their clients, get comments and have everything look very clean, very pr professional, which is, which is, you know, what, what you'd expect, um, you know, especially from, uh, you know, uh, someone like Visco, who's, who's been building products for a while for, for photographers. Um, another thing we actually just launched today, this is like even hot off the press news is, uh, you know, back to helping our community find work with brands. So we actually launched uh, a brand challenge with uh, Liquid IV which um, in the U.S. is a, is a pretty big um, hydration brand. And, you know, most people know things like Gatorade, but there's a whole new generation of hydration products that are out there. And Liquid IV is, is one of the more popular ones. Um, it's a global brand, but yeah, I think it's pretty prominent in the U.S. And with these brand challenges now, we are allowing our members to basically participate in those challenges and submit work. And then we, Visco, will work with Liquid IV to pick you know, one of the, the, the top choices uh, from that competition and that content will get licensed. And so it's an opportunity for people to get their work licensed by notable brands. They get paid and they get, you know, a nice notable client on, on, on the resume. So we're going to have a lot more of those coming up, but that's another sort of set of exciting cool. things that we're doing to help the photography community. Yeah, I like that. And it's as you said, like one thing that's so important to you guys is, you know, not just giving photographers the tools in the community, but actually also just the exposure. And, and one of the hardest things as a photographer is just getting the next job. Um, yes. Amazing. Um, yeah. We might wrap things up here. And um, if anyone listening to this is on uh, the newsletter for Narrative or Visco, you might have seen, but we've been doing a partnership with Visco where um, Narrative users get 25% off Visco Pro, which has a lot of the the features which we've been talking about today and visco users get 30 percent off narrative pro which um yeah has uh, access to our uh, ai assisted calling tools and um editing features as well so um you can just jump on to google and, and search narrative visco and you'll find uh access to those to those if you want to jump on eric yeah. thank you so much for uh jumping on today absolute joy to talk and um, I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Yeah, same, James. Thanks so much for the time. Appreciate it.